Let's welcome Reverend Jeannie Shaw. Thank you, Steve. I feel like I'm coming home to Trinity. Thank you. So before I read scriptures, may I give us all a little bit of background. We are an Easter people, right? Called not to lead the people of God to the promised land, but to lead people to the promises of God. And this is a challenging task in what is now a post-Christian world. Recently, the Washington Post reported that for the first time in our nation, Christians are no longer a majority of the population. 47% claim a life with Jesus. So I dug a little deeper and learned that in Sacramento, it's even less. Only 34.7% of Sacramento counties describe themselves as followers of Jesus. We live in a post-Christian world. And this is where I believe we can draw wisdom from the early church. I know something about Trinity. I know you all are biblical scholars, but let me give you a bit of the backstory. Following the Pentecost experience, where the disciples were empowered with the gift of the Holy Spirit, those clueless disciples finally got the message. They were the ones that Jesus had called to build his church. So in Jerusalem, the disciples began teaching and preaching and caring for the widows and or orphans, feeding the hungry, and sharing all that they had with one another. And the church in Jerusalem grew. The church always grows when we do the work of Jesus. But as the disciples continued to do all this work, they experienced what we would now call burnout, right? And they needed help. And so they reached out to seven individuals, including Stephen, and laid hands on them and ordained them as deacons. It's, it's where we as Presbyterians get that tradition of laying hands. How many of you are ordained as deacons? Yeah, it's important work, and it goes back to the very disciples that Jesus called. So Stephen was this charismatic leader. He was a fearless preacher and worked great wonders, the Bible says, and we know from our own history that great leaders have great adversaries. And Stephen was hauled up in front of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish on false charges of blasphemy. And when it came time for him to speak in his defense, he gave this courageous speech, summarizing Israel's history and culminating in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the Sanhedrin covered their ears in absolute horror, dragged Stephen outside the city gates, and stoned him to death. He was the first martyr in our Christian faith. And many of the people that worshiped in Jerusalem were terrified, justifiably so, and they left town and a few went to the city of Antioch, north of Jerusalem. And this is where our story begins. Hear the word of God. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them... However, men and women from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them about the news of our Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was upon them, 
and a great number of people turned and believed in the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when Barnabas arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them to be true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found Saul, he brought him back to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught a great number of people. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. During this time, a prophet came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted a great famine would spread over Jerusalem. And the disciples, as each one was able, in Antioch decided to provide help for their brothers and sisters living in Jerusalem. And this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of God through the book of Acts. Thanks be to God. So Antioch was a major city by the time that Barnabas was sent to investigate what was happening. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria, was an important trade destination and a thriving cultural center. And it, it was a river port. The conversions of the Silk Road and the Roman Royal Road, the Appian Way, and thus was made the eastern capital of the Roman Empire. So did this description of Antioch sound familiar? A river port? the conversion of two main thoroughfares, a capital city, might as well be Sacramento, 80 I-5 Riverport. Sure sounds like we're talking about Sacramento. And if you think about it, I think there's a lot we can learn from that early church. Because when the Antioch Church was founded, there were no session meetings talking about how a church would be planted or grow. There were only men and women talking about Jesus. And the Roman historian Tertullian wrote, look at those Christians, how they love one another. So that was the whole plan, sharing about Jesus and loving one another. And the church that was birthed from those two simple things changed the face of the world. As the Antioch church grew from people talking about Jesus and loving one another, the disciples in Jerusalem got worried and threatened because the Jerusalem model was based on people coming to their church and sitting in their pews. They wondered how the people in Antioch would know Jesus if they didn't come to Jerusalem. So the disciples sent a trusted member to get the down low on what was happening up in Antioch, and they chose Barnabas. I love how Luke describes Barnabas. He wasn't described as a great preacher or a finance guy or a PhD in systematic theology. Luke only says he was a good man, a man of faith. Here you have this church that changed the face of the world by a good man, a man of faith. And I look around our presbytery and I, I can think of hundreds of men and women who meet that description. A good man, a good woman, 
man or woman of great faith. Barnabas taught us another lesson from Antioch. He sought help. And he went to Tarsus and brought back this new convert by the name of Saul, Paul. And together, they discipled the church in Antioch for a year. It was Paul's starting point. And from what Paul learned in Antioch, he started churches, including the one in the home of Lydia in Philippi in Macedonia, the very first church on European soil. And that church spread the good news of Jesus northward to southern France, to Germany, across the channel to England, and then across the pond to places like Plymouth Rock, and then across the plains to gold rush towns like Sacramento. <coughs> that Antioch church turned this fledgling Christian church upside down. The Jerusalem church expected people to come to them. And the Antioch church expected people to go out into the world. The Jerusalem church shared the good news of Jesus only with Jews, people like them. And the Antioch church spread the news to Romans, Greeks, Cyrenians, men, women, enslaved, and free. I think as Presbyterians, we have a long history of being an Antioch church. And Trinity is an Antioch church. Years ago, you had mission trips to Laos and Cambodia. Remember those? Your Latino ministry is alive. Your out-of-the-box hunger ministry. You are an Antioch church. But so often what happens when our membership declines, our Antioch passion to go out into the world reverts to being a Jerusalem model. We become fearful about our resources, more concerned about our Jerusalem buildings, putting on a new roof or recovering pews than the mission of the Antioch Church in our world today. Our Presbyterian Church has a long history of being an Antioch Church. Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is a great example. Teams of volunteers working to rebuild in the aftermath of disaster. Just two weeks ago, we were up in Paradise where the Presbyterians are still present, helping families rebuild after that terrible fire. And I've discovered in leading PDA teams that you never know where God is going to use you. I took a team from this presbytery up to Minot, uh, South Dakota. And after a terrible flood where a 19-foot wall of water came down the sewer, the Moose, Mouse River, and flooded the town, one of the women that we were working to rebuild her home lost her brother somewhere in the flood he disappeared. We were rebuilding her home, which had nine feet of water and mold. And she was in an apartment living with her elderly mother, caring for her mother. And on Friday, I read in the newspaper that her brother's body had been found. And so we went to her house with flowers and a Bible and a plant. And she opened the door and she said, Pastor Jeannie, how did you know? And I said, well, we read in the paper that your brothers had been found. And we came to bring our condolences. And she said, you don't understand. My mother just died five minutes ago. I have no family, and no home. And my church was destroyed during the flood, and I have no minister. And God sent you. 
You never know when you're doing the work of God how God is going to use you. Our Presbyterian Church has over 250 men and women serving in over 80 countries, working to end human trafficking in the Philippines, ending lead contamination in Peru and in Flint, Michigan, teaching universities in Malawi, supporting hospitals and clinics and schools and universities. And you never know how God is going to use you. I took a team from this presbytery to Kenya, and we were helping support the Kikuyu people build a school. And we went to this restaurant one night, and the chef was organizing the buffet and, and saw my name tag, and he said, why, why are you here in Kenya? And I said, well, I'm a Presbyterian pastor, and we're here supporting the Kikuyu Presbyterian Church building a school. Do you know the Presbyterians? And he gets this, like, faraway look in his eye, and he said, when I was five, I was blinded, and my mother could not afford two bus tickets to go across the country to the hospital. So she put a sign on my neck and pinned it to my shirt that said, Kikuyu Presbyterian Church, and put me on the bus. And I got to the hospital, and the doctors gave me back my sight. And then he looked me right in the eye, and he said, yes. I know the Presbyterians. You never know how God is going to use you when you become an Antioch church. One of the focuses in our call to be a Matthew 25 church as Presbyterians is to end hunger. Up until I took this new job two months ago, I was the pastor of the Presbyterian church in Truckee. And during the snow, both 80 was closed going to Reno and to Sacramento. And the sheriffs had no food. And all the supermarkets were giving me just carloads after carloads of food because the, the power was off and the generators weren't working. And so they had to like clear out all of their freezers. And so I was just laden with food and I, I took carloads to the sheriffs and they were like pastor genie thank you we have no food and they were so grateful that i just started bringing them food every single week and got to know all of the sheriffs and there's a jail there and i got to know the inmates and pretty soon we were talking about the bible and i was praying with this one inmate and on easter he said to me pastor genie could you baptize me want to be a Christian. So I brought all of our elders over to the jail, and, and here Michael, this tall guy that had every inch of his body totally tattooed, tears streaming down his face, kneeling in the sheriff's office, baptized and becoming a child of God. You never know how God is going to use you when you reach out in mission. These are fearful times in our post-Christian world because we're not only post-Christian, we're also post-pandemic. And as we have lived through this pandemic, we've also uncovered the structural racism in our nation and the systematic poverty in our communities. And as we recognize with more and more storm and heat waves how our lack of stewardship has affected God's precious planet, 
And as these concerns, poverty and racism and a ravished earth, it's probably the most important lesson we can learn from Antioch. A prophet in the Antioch church discerned that there would be a famine in Jerusalem. And so these new Christians in this new church in Antioch gave sacrificially. And it was the Antioch church that then sent food to Jerusalem and saved the people in Jerusalem. It was, it was this new church that saved the Jerusalem church. When we share, when we give, when we do the mission of Jesus, our churches grow. And when we face the hard and difficult issues of the day, we are being Antioch. And when we follow the leading of the Antioch church, there's always enough for us all. I once heard this story from Craig Barnes, the past president of Princeton, about the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Maybe some of you have visited that beautiful museum. In St. Petersburg, during the last days of World War II, when the people realized that the Nazi soldiers were going to surround and conquer St. Petersburg, the docents in the museum took every one of the paintings out of the frames and carefully packed them in boxes and sent them by train hiding in barns high in the Ural Mountains where the Nazis would not find them. But the museum stayed open even after the Nazis had surrounded the city and the city was in severe famine. And the docents of the museum every day would give tours and they would point to the envy, empty canvases and say, Look at this Monet. Look how this Impressionist has light reflecting on the water with the water lilies. Or they would go to Leonardo da Vinci and say, look at this Madonna and child. Look how Leonardo has captured this real child. And look how the baby Jesus is reaching to his mother's face. Or to Rembrandt and the prodigal son. Do you see how Rembrandt has captured the light coming down on the forgiven father and the forgiven younger son? But look how in the shadows you have the unforgiving older brother in darkness. And people, in this very difficult time, were given hope by the docents. We are docents, you and I, not to an empty canvas, but to an empty cross. The Son of God, who died, and was resurrected, that we can bring the hope to all the people of the world. May all we do, may all we believe, be a spirit of the new Antioch Church. Amen.